who's next? Mishy? Um, I'll put the last things later. Okay. I'll put the last things later, but my initial thing, because um, obviously this is about um, land ownership, um, at the moment it's obviously very vague as to what we could get, and by we, I don't mean the trust, um, but don't mean the, I'm on about supporters generally, not just ones who are members of the trust. Um, Hadley have said, I believe, that they're interested in offering some sort of fan ownership. Uh, presumably you don't know whether that's full fan ownership, whether it will be staged or a percentage of fan ownership. What would be your bottom line? What would be the trust's bottom line in saying, okay, we'll settle for that? Because maybe they don't want to give the whole thing over at once. Uh, could there be some sort of um, shared ownership or something like that? What's the least you'd agree to? And also, and also, uh, because obviously we're slightly, if things go to plan, we're slightly better off, thankfully, hopefully, than other clubs, as in we won't have to raise money for the ground being built. That'll be part of the whole planning application. Um, so, in terms of that, if you're handed the whole, the whole thing over, do you think you're professional enough, I don't mean, I'm not you personally, or the time is generalising, do you think we could be professional enough to take it over from the start? When would you settle for taking over? Would you want us bedded in first? With a coming, you know, all that sort of thing? That's think, a big question. I think that it is a big question. Uh, and I think that tonight is about starting those discussions. I think that, that that's that's what this event is about. Um, and I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm not gonna tell you what my bottom, bottom line is. But, uh, <laughs> I think it's fair to say yeah. as well as a support trust that we represent the people who are our members and so in terms yeah. of a recommendation from a support trust that's something which we would put forward to the fans and to, to, to our members as, as, as members of the trust and then we would look at you know what, what they were agreeing to as members of the trust as well as opposed to just the, the view of the board so it would be an open decision I think. So you feel you also represent, I'm just again, you say you represent your trust members quite rightly so. Yeah. Of course. Do you, do you also represent the rest of the support who aren't members? Well, uh, I mean... The, I know they should join the Nigel well, but... Can I maybe, maybe give a little context of some of the other groups? Um, clearly, an absolute key objective is to get as many people as possible in support of them in the local community to share the objects of this, to join and be part of any support run club. Now, the reality is, um, where trusts have taken control in the past, so I think back to uh, someone like Wrexham, for example, who had all sorts of struggles to protect their ground, did some fantastic work, but still, almost the day they took over Wrexham Football Club, had about 500 members, um, and now they've got about three and a half thousand members. Now, you know, it's a bit more attractive obviously to join and own a football club than it is necessarily a sports trust and what I suppose, I, I mean I think we're all probably guilty of this, we might believe in a lot of things but we don't necessarily join them, um, so clearly a big piece of work that, and this I think is the, almost as well, it's part of the start of that really, is, is to get out beyond just the, the, the trust members into you know the whole support of, um, movement at Dulwich and the wider community to see if this is what people want because Actually, it might be no surprise, but if the majority ultimately don't want it, then you're just storing up problems further down the line. And, and sort of going back to some of the stuff that went on at Portsmouth, albeit on a grander scale, I mean, the, the first time I remember going down there, I mean, what were there, about 50 supporters groups? And every single, I felt like, you know, there were people there who were speaking on behalf of about 15 different supporters organisation and, and there was a point where we had to kind of say and, and it's and it's the same with a lot of clubs that we, we have to do this as one or be it respect you know the historic supporters groups and factions and you know people who stand here and do this and that you know it, it's going to work if the majority of people want it to happen and you know if if after this meeting and beyond only the people in this room or only half the people in this room think it's going to work it's not going to work because people will start criticising, people here will be 
they'll be not seeing their families and all sorts of things because they'll just be committing so much more and more time. You know, this is a really bleak picture now, but there'll be a smaller and smaller group of people. Hey, it sounds a bit like a lot of privately owned clubs that are making decisions, they're not engaging anyone, and they'll get a lot of criticism. People just, in the end, it'll, it'll, it'll fail. That said, if you do the engagement, you consult people, you go outside the membership, and you know, you get buy-in and support for this, then you will absolutely thrive and fly if you get it right. So, um, you know, end on a positive note. But uh, and, and the other question, sorry if I'm jumping on the mic here, but this, this percentage thing is really, comes up a lot. And, and we've heard along here that with, there's all sorts of different connotations of, you know, 90% plus one, 48 something, plus a shareholders agreement, 100%, 100%. Um, it, it all depends on the circumstance. Everyone here is different. It, as I said before, we are, I think, in a fortunate position that um, potentially you could have a fantastic facility built for you. We could have a, a friendly opportunity to take over control of the club. You know, the starting point, I always think, is is full control 100%. Um, and there's different reasons for that some of which are actually the way that the club is viewed. So, you know, we all have this tendency to look at clubs, football clubs, and look for who's the man who's got the money, or, you know, who, who, who's, who's the shake here, or whatever. And what we want to do is get collective responsibility for the football club. That means all the voluntary hours, that means everyone chipping in, you know, rather than relying on one or two individuals, because, you know, that can work, but it can be dangerous because people might rely more and more on those people. There's other more boring reasons why 100% is better as well, like um, Wimbledon and you know their community shares and they need to raise money and there's tax incentives and all sorts. But that's a bit dull. But for now, I, I think start with 100% would be my thing and, and, and only go there if everyone wants it. So hopefully that's just. Who else? Yeah, could you take that to Robert? Hello there. Uh, can I ask the experts on the panel um, how uh, things are organised at their clubs? Or are there trusts like uh, industrial provident societies or community interest companies or etc.? So if you could each explain briefly, that'd be great. So I'll start with you. <laughs> yeah, no, I so, uh, yeah, don't trust these Society. Um, we've got nine board members. Um, we've got about 2,600 members, 2,000 adult members. Um, that's stayed pretty static since we since we formed. We average around a home gate about 4,000, 2,800 season ticket holders. So it's a fairly large proportion of the fan base. And you know, whenever we're kind of looking to extend the club or raise money, uh, a large part of it relies on donations of both money and time from the fan base to make it happen. So um, it's really, you know, it, it, it's, it's um, you know, a labour of love, like they say. So, but I think the, the points are, I don't know what the risks are to a run Premier League club um, about supporter ownership. Uh, but, you know, the budget, I don't know what sort of budget is the Dulwich Hamlet, do you know what the overall budget is? <laughs> no, I, I don't know, you know, but um, you know, I, I could relate it back to when we were at that level. So, in terms of having a um, a business model that you can make work as a mix of volunteers from the revenue that you raise, I think if you're getting average gates close to nine hundred thousand, then you should be getting close to something that work. If you can get the stadium with a 106, then, you know, that kind of contribution from the Football Foundation, uh, then, then you've probably got a viable model. The, 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 the question then becomes, you know, can you put enough enthusiasm and time into sustaining that over the longer term? Um, you know, that's, that's really the asset test. In terms of the rest of the ownership, we are effectively 100% owned. You know, the only reason lots of people contributed to the PLC is because they believed in the principle of, um, of uh, you know, what we were trying to achieve. So there's plenty of shareholders who not even see the game at Wimbledon, but they put money in 
you know, the minimum share issue was around about £100, pounds, um, and, and that, that managed to succeed. So it's really a device, the PLC, to get the ownership of the, of the stadium. Um, but yeah, but we're 100% industrial I think I'll probably touch on the situation at Pompey already. But and I think, to some extent, we're out of your league, so to speak, in terms of a, of a model to follow. I think you're probably better off looking at Fisher or Enfield in, in, the, in that respect. I, I don't mean anything against women, but I can tell you what. Having 16,000 people at a home game doesn't guarantee you a win, as he knows. Um, and also, James touched upon uh, Portsmouth. I mean, I don't know how many you know, supporters clubs there are. Uh, for Dulwich, there's probably one, isn't there? Two, maybe? Yeah. Supporters clubs, as opposed to trusts. Or is this it? You know, are you one and the same? I don't know. James touched on the number of supporters clubs we've got. I mean, within Portsmouth itself, you know, it's seen, I, 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 I'm, I'm truly astonished that most of them are still going, actually. But, you know, the trust acts as an umbrella. But the problem with, with Portsmouth, there's an old saying amongst the fans, you know, with the disagreements that go on even today about what's going on and what should be going on. Um, I think the saying goes sometimes, if in doubt, have a punch up. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the umbrella is, is the trust, so to speak, and, um, you know, we've got members on the trust who are from all the different supporters club in the city, out of the city. Attendances, 16,000. Trust members, about four. Shareholders, probably two and a half thousand. Then you've got other members. 40% of the fan base from within the island, 60% travel in from outside to home games. I mean, I think back on things like 225,000 people turned up on South Sea Common for the FA Cup, you know, Bonanza. Um, 33,000 wanted tickets for the semi finals, 25,000 plus wanted tickets for the finals that we went to. Why have we only got 4,000? I mean, I, don't, I, I talked to some of your guys earlier about fan base here, and just out of interest, as a spot check, if you suddenly had a situation where you had to save this club from imminent closure, which is when your membership will peak, trust me, um, because once fans think the club is safe, the membership, the interest drops off. When you get a problem, as I'm sure everybody else would find the same, because I certainly did going up and down the country talking to different league clubs with their trust. How did their membership ever flow? It depended not on what you were doing on the pitch always, it was to how well were your finances. If you faced them in a disaster, membership soared. If you were secure in the mind of the fan, it flowed. When we had the Russians come along, <coughs> Something like two, two and a half thousand members of the trust. The Russians came along, um, offered us salvation. The membership dipped within a year to 800. So, is that of interest? Are you all Dulwich fans here now? Apart from my husband, probably. Right. If you were suddenly asked to put up a thousand pounds tomorrow, how many would do it? Without question. Without question. No, to raise money towards, you know, buying the club. How many? What have we got? Half a dozen? Half a dozen. Okay. Anybody capable of putting up a five-figure sum? When you come to the day when you start thinking about shares, think very carefully about the figure you aim to get from everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, could those people who put their hands up and have a grand to spare please leave their name and their number? Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Fisher, 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 Fisher are a Dustin Robinson Society um, that owns and runs the club. Uh, despite in different form on the pitch and despite being homeless, we actually we did okay for volunteers, so we have a, a good turnout of people. Um, who want to get involved and want to help, including a number of new people who actually were not supporters of Fisher Athletic um, uh, and have become supporters of Fisher FC and members and part owners of Fisher FC and who now volunteer for us, um, do the website, that sort of thing. Um, and I think being supporter owned some, and, and feeling, so volunteers feeling like they have a genuine stake in 
in the club um, encourages people to do a little bit more than perhaps they, they would they would do if, if it was owned by somebody else. Uh, as an example, um, our manager joined as a, as a member of the trust at the start of the season. Uh, he left his position as the first team manager um, uh, about six weeks ago. Um, and three weeks after that, um, he turned up in the boardroom to help us out, help us making the tea, help us put a game on. And it's that kind of ethos that, that you can develop, I think, as a supporter own player. Our structure is one where we have an industrial provenance society, Enfield Town Supporter Society, uh, and below that we have a 100% owned limited company, ETFC Limited, that carries out the trading transactions of the club. At the moment we've got around just over 200 members, um, but as you just heard, it's usually in times of desperation that the, actually the, the membership peaks. And back at the time when Enfield were going through their problems, we had a membership of over 500. Um, and in fact, our meetings, we had more people come to our meetings that could be bothered to go to some out, far-flung outpost in Hertfordshire that the chairman was making us play at the time. Uh, so we had much higher attendances at our meetings. Um, so you're in a different situation. You know, at the moment, you've got your ground, uh, you're doing well, um, you've got great support. So, you know, you don't see an immediate problem. <coughs> so I can understand, perhaps, you know, the concern as to, you know, are all the supporters together because it seems at the moment there's not an issue but you have an opportunity and it's good that you can put it on the evenings like this evening so you can try to understand a little bit more about the way clubs are run and I have to say the knowledge of the clubs that are uh, this is known as a well-run club um, certainly when we started our club there was a little bit of concern by the football authorities can you have supporters running the football club um, what we did, we had many of the directors of the old football club come on board with us. I think that's important. You've got expertise in this club. You need to make sure you keep hold of that expertise. So you run a very, very good football club as it is. So whilst you all support us together, everybody's in it together. And that's the other feeling that you have with the supporters direct club, is that you certainly feel the wins more, you enjoy the wins more, you certainly feel the defeats more as well, uh, which we've had a few seasons of. Um, but it certainly is there more of a feel of in it together than you have when it's a club that you don't necessarily have. You can't have a say in, in most clubs. Here you can have a say. You can come to your meetings. For example, we've got our AGM next week and we'll be putting before the membership a couple of options. We're having a share, community share issue and there are some options as to what we will do with regards to the money that we raise. And we're putting that open discussion for the supporters. What do they want? Perhaps we need a new bar. Perhaps we need to do something more with our training facilities. There's always one, isn't there? <laughs> and also, we do a lot of community work. Most of the supporters that come on a Saturday are not too bothered about that. But everyone can have a say. They can come along to the meeting and they can put their view across and we're democratic and we'll take a vote at the end of the evening and we'll take forward the idea that we think that uh, where the supporters would recommend us to go forward with. Um, just to Follow that up, um, Mishi uh, asked about the um, uh, professional nature of running a club. I mean, it's running a business, essentially. Uh, particularly to um, Paul and Dan, obviously, because they're at our level. Um, did you have any specific training or did the directors or the board have any specific training? Um, because you, you probably, I, I mean, I don't know how many uh, salaried people Employ, if you employ uh, a sort of operations manager or anything like that. Um, just, just at that point, really, what sort of training did you have? Sure. Um, um, Supports Direct run a whole range of um, development programs for people on the board, but but I think lots of people came in with very little training in how to run a football club, but plenty of outside experience that they could bring in. So, so Ben, our chair, is a qualified company secretary, um, is exceptionally good on, on governance and generally doing things properly, which is quite important. Um, and everybody who has uh, joined the board uh, or has volunteered uh, brings some skills to the party. I would echo James's point about not 
not losing what we got. We were we were lucky um, when we transitioned um, into fan ownership to have Martin Eade around. You know Martin. Martin knows football. He was he was chairman for our first year, um, and his contacts within football and his knowledge of how to navigate the leagues, the FA, uh, those, those wonderful, helpful people. Uh, and um, actually, they work quite helpful. But there's a lot of there's a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of rules you have to obey. So having people who know that is, is incredibly helpful. Um, I, what I would say is, I think there are plenty of private owners of football clubs who don't have a great deal of training and may call themselves businessmen, but aren't necessarily the greatest or have the greatest track record in actually running profitable businesses. There are plenty of people who do, but there, there are certainly people out there. Just because you, you call yourself a businessman doesn't mean you're good at it. Thanks. Uh, one of the points was um, what Sarah employees we have. Well, other than the uh, plain staff and the bar staff, there are no salary employees because we have this great world of volunteers. In fact, it's difficult actually to actually pay somebody to it. For example, our, our groundsmen, you can't keep them away from the club. Uh, um, so, you know, it's uh, this feeling that everyone's in it together and uh, everyone wants to help. And there's certainly more of a, uh, an inclination for members to get involved in one way or another. So, um, in terms of, you know, that's obviously a great cost saving for us because we don't have to employ people. Although, as the club is starting to grow now, we are, be, we are looking to employ a stadium manager from next season. So we will start to move into that direction and we see that as our progression. Eventually, we will have a club with full-time employees, uh, bar manager, etc. But uh, at this stage, we, we don't have that. Okay, who's... Uh... Thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations on what you've all achieved at your clubs. I think the fact that you're, you're all here and smiling quite a bit tonight, I think it's testimony to what you've achieved. You all said that there's been a lot of ups and downs on the way. With hindsight, looking back on the route that you've travelled, what do you wish you might have done differently uh, that might help us in considering whether we embark on the same sort of process? That's a tricky one. Um, sack a couple of managers. Um, <laughs> that's the obvious one. Uh, no, I, I think you, you will make mistakes as you go along because it will be new for you. But you learn from those mistakes. That's the thing to do. Is that uh, as you uh, uh, get more involved and you understand uh, the facility that you're managing uh, um, and what employees you need to have. These are the things that we're starting to grapple with now that we've got our own home. Uh, uh, we, we were spoilt before because we had a ground share whereby we, all we had to do is turn up on a Saturday or a Tuesday night and uh, uh, get the place ready and go again. Uh, now we've got our own property and it's, it's a different ball game altogether. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, you, you just have to, you will make mistakes uh, where you, as you go along. Um, but I think uh, as long as you keep the expertise that you've got on board already, then you minimise those mistakes. Um, so I, I think that's very important for you. That's a very good question, um, and I can't think of, a, of an obvious answer other than to say, uh, as Paul said, there are lots of things you do wrong um, that you learn from. Like, I can't think of any big, big thing that I wish we'd done slightly differently. Um, there are certainly decisions that you wish you'd had turned out better, as are around the manager. Um, but it, it's um, you do learn from your mistakes. I can't I, come back to me if I uh, if I do think of anything in particular. But I can't right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's an excellent question. I probably wish that I hadn't have stood up at the very first steering, well, the very first meeting of the trust before even the steering group and made it known to at least one person who's now the chairman of the trust that I'd been a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess uh, one of them is the one we touched on before, is that um, it is a business, you run a business, but it is a different business, it's a football club business, so you really do need um, either people who've got the relevant experience about how football works, 
um, or we've got that on tap somehow. I mean, we were fortunate that um, David Bernard, who's the Secretary of Chelsea, is also the Chief Executive of Women's FC, um, who was opposed to the move as well. Um, and he's always been available to us um, throughout the, since our formation, really, to give us sound advice on, on you know, football matters. Um, and other, and other football-related people that um, you know, have offered their services to the way. So I think that kind of advice for me, if you don't have the skills in-house, I think retaining the directions you've got to be great for the you know, suggestion, if, if, if that's possible. Uh, we didn't have that <coughs> sort of um, option open to us. I think the other one really is, is um, it's really about control, I guess. Um, it is a, a great endeavour. It's a fantastic thing to do, and I recommend that you do it if you ask me <coughs> if you do it or not. Um, but volunteers come in all sorts of shapes and sizes and motivations, so you have to be a bit careful about how much and how far you let people in to do things. Um, people have a habit of assuming that they, they're doing more than they're doing, or they're doing it their way, and they don't want to do it any other way. So you've got to kind of try and, um, at the same time, welcome and be a broad church and get everybody on board and enthused, but still manage it in a way. And that's really down to the trust board. And I'd say that applies even if you start getting, if you have a separate executive and trust board structure, that relationship's absolutely critical. You've got to make sure you're either in control of those people or they're, they're the same people. Um, those are probably the, the two or three things I'd say. Yeah. Could, I, could I just say also, don't, don't just rely on what we've, we've talked, to, talked about tonight. Go and talk to as many other trusts as you possibly can. Each trust will have its own story. Each trust will tell you how they evolved. So there's so many different ways of doing it. Talk to as many as you can and try and pick the best ideas from them all. There was a question at the back of it. A, uh, a question on Twitter first and then come across to you to Andy. Uh, it's coming from the uh, pigeon stands. Um, how have the managers felt about working with band and clubs? Is there anything that differs from the norm? Um, I think, I think oh, well, I'll I yeah. ask this quickly yeah. because um, not being at a club, but I can give a little taste of some things that I've seen that have gone really well. Uh, and, and I think that you do need to um, ideally recruit or certainly make it clear that this football club is a little bit different to some of the other football clubs and clearly that might be around budget um, but as we all know a manager can, have a, uh, can be a very important opinion leader and um, to a degree needs to buy into the ethos of what the club's trying to do. Um, and there's been some really good things out there where the trusts have signed the manager up, got the players signed up, um, really got them as an ambassador for what they're trying to do, which works extremely well. Um, so, and there have been opposite cases where someone doesn't understand what the club's all about, and um, can quite easily say things that, that can cause, cause uh, divisions within the support base. So it's a bit of an educating process, I think, and it's definitely something that's worth investing the time into because as much as we all, some of us might get excited by rules and policies, the majority get excited by the football and then by the manager and what they do. So get them on board, is what I would say. Joe, did you want to oh, come in on that? Only, only to add and say that um, <clears throat> the current manager we've got, Andy Orford, ex Pompey, um, is very passionate about working for the Trust, although it's an indirect thing, but so passionate that he actually persuaded all the present squad to buy a share, not individually, collectively. So he's, he's achieved that, and the previous two managers have, have been quite happy to work for a club where the Trust has a, a major part to say. Yeah, um, we've had five managers, three of them, but one of them still with us. Uh, <laughs> um, two of them come back regularly, very, very welcome. The other um, two we see very little of. Um, I think the, the, the two in the middle, Dave Anderson, 
um, who's recently, I think, announced he's leaving Harrow Borough, and um, Terry Brown, um, you know, uh, were, were and are massive supporters of the club uh, and everything that we're doing. So, so that works really well. Uh, it's a bit like the saying that you don't have to be mad to work here, but it helps. You don't have to be a fan of the club and support what you do with a fan of the club, but it certainly helps. And, and they were a big part of our success, and largely because they felt like that. So, so you know, it's certainly one of the questions you'd want to ask when you were. Mm -hmm. Okay, Andy, I think you had a question. Yeah. Do you, do you want to? Oh, sorry. Hi everyone. Um, first of all, I just wanted to um, send apologies from our manager Gavin Rose tonight because um, he's, he's actually got team training. He would have liked to have been here and he's very enthusiastic to, to see the video recording of, of this meeting tonight. So he's very involved in the club, obviously through Aspire, etc. So he sends his apologies. Um, my question, I guess it's directed towards James, not happy for any of the panel to answer. Um, within a 100% within a fan-owned club, um, how do you generate revenue stream, um, aside from, say, the obvious sponsorship and advertising, how do you get local businesses interested in the club, investing in money, however much it might be, um, based on the fact that they may not get anything back if there's no share option? Um, and also, is the, the CIC model um, something that sports Supports um, um, direct. Um, is is that something that you consider as an option, or is it off your agenda? Um, and well, and, and how can you grab, generate revenue streams? Sure. So community interest um, yeah, company is CIC. So before you answer, could you just explain briefly? <coughs> do we all know what support the class know? Yeah. Really, whatever. Um, but what's the CIC for people who don't know? Okay, I'll deal with the more interesting one first, albeit I do probably enjoy answering the other one. <laughs> but the more interesting one, I think, for most is how do you generate the revenues um, and how, you know, how do we compete? And um, actually, it's good, we've done some work on this, and we've, and we've um, so it's not just me chatting away, it's, we've, we've actually kind of thought, well, this is important because clearly there's other clubs that you might be competing against that uh, have got cash injections from private owners which you know are artificially inflating their wage budgets and um, as much as we want to be worthy and pleased that we own our club, ultimately if you're getting thumped every single week and people ramming it down your throat, that's going to test some people's resolve about how much they love the model. Well, for us, it's all about how you utilize that model so we think there are actual business advantages to being supporter owned so they might not they might be a little bit harder to achieve than getting on the phone to um, someone with lots of money who's just willing to put it in the club but we actually think that that is actually a problem not just the sustainability factor but as I said before in the way the clubs perceive because We've already heard here all the volunteer time and effort that goes in. So, for example, I know AFC Telford United actually put a figure of 300 grand a year that they reckon they get in volunteer time. People give up for AFC Telford United that if they paid basically minimum wage for all the time it went in. So, to put that one out there, um, okay, there's other clubs that are privately owned, people do volunteer for them, um, some of which have got a real good culture and people. You know, and, and probably have got a good value to you. But the majority, I would say, you're more likely to look at thinking, okay, here's a few people with a lot of money, and if they can pay someone to do this, how am I going to volunteer to do it? So there's that. Then there's the business community. So, you know, you a football club is exciting for many local, you know, communities, and people will sponsor it for different reasons. If you're a community-owned club, you've got something different, a little bit extra to sell to your community. You know, the, 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 the values and principles. In fact, I saw in an article with Jobsite at Portsmouth this week saying why they sponsor Portsmouth was because of the model, actually. It's because of the fact that the club is owned by the many, because of the fact that 
if they do make any money, it should be reinvested back in the club. There isn't this, you know, a few individuals that are, that are there. Uh, you know, this is this is genuinely something. It's a community venture. So there's an opportunity with a sponsor that I think you've got a different discussion than you'd have. You know, there's clubs, again, Telford United's sponsor is committed to 2017, and that was three or four years ago. So every year in their budget, they know that Cap Gemini are going to give them X amount of money. And that's because they buy into what they're doing. And that's really because of the model of ownership. So if you can start developing business relationships like that, that's a massive fillet for where you're going. Um, the local partnerships is important, but often it's around the stadium and, and build, but as we've heard from Dan and in fact probably all of these guys, you know, local authorities lending money, local authorities entering into Walling Six agreements. Um, if you are a, a community owned body, you are more likely to, to open yourself up to partnerships and relationships with local authorities um, and others because they can engage with you. You know, a lot of clubs in and around your league are probably, you know, they're not making any money, none of the shareholders are going to get a return, but they, and they feel like a community and club, you know, it's a good spirit of the club, but if you look on Company's House, it says they're a private company, and that stops some organisations just being able to deal with them. So that's why there are a number of clubs that are looking at this model, because it's, it's a blocker for some of these relationships. Um, so, what else have we got? Uh, good testimony. There is a slide on this, unfortunately. Take you through it. Um, Maybe if you just explain the difference between a, a CIC. I'll do that. Yeah, yeah. So um, there are different models that that would be we consider as community owned, and uh, the, the one that all these guys, and in fact every one bar one of our clubs, use is the Industrial Problem Society, or to give it slightly snazzier, north, new name of Community Benefit Society. Um, they all use that model. Now, there are other ways that a community interest company can achieve the same values as a, um, as a support round club or an IPS. Um, and we would, in theory, be willing, and we have set up a club as a kick before and it's becoming quite popular because people understand companies a bit more than they do mutuals. Um, that said there are a few like technical reasons why we would promote the IPS model if you've got a choice. It could be using the trust model, it could be setting up a completely new IPS. Um, so uh, it, it's really without kind of getting into too much detail, it's around, um, I see a kick primarily as almost being set up as being in between the sort of purest community model and a, and a business model. Um, so there's caps and limits on things like returns for shareholders and there's an asset lock which is the same with an IPS. Um, but it if you've got an option to go with the IPS, which is, which is just that little bit more pure in a different way, a few different ways, a little bit easier to raise money if you do need to go out for a share issue, there aren't quite the same barriers you'd have if you're an IPS because you're not a company and companies are part of the Financial Services and Markets Act, whereas IPSs or Community Benefit Societies aren't because they're seen that they do genuinely just exist for the benefit of the community. Um, so there, there's a few little tweaks, and, and you know, if this progresses, and if I get my computer working and I'm invited back, then I will <laughs> go into a lot more detail on these on these points. Um, there's actually we've just done a similar thing with Chelmsford City, and there's quite a lot of good stuff out there actually on their website which also looked at kicks and why they've chosen this model. But um, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's got the potential to be a, a community-owned model, as has, um, you know, you could use a company and sort of knock it into what looks like a community-owned body. But it, for me, it seems like if you've got what is almost the perfect thing, why try and change something else to, to fit it?
Okay, um, last couple of questions. Uh, <coughs> yeah, one of the things, obviously, when there's a support, I've got the Trust One Club, um, or whatever, Sport One Club, is, um, is the transition. And I, I've got no idea how it would work. Let's say we got our football utopia and it was agreed the club would be handed over. One thing I'm interested in is, is A, how would that work? Because as you've touched on, there's a great, and I don't mean me personally, I've only been on a football club committee for three years, and if I was voted up, I'd just go back on the terraces. But there's a lot of people on the football club committee who've literally given decades and decades of service. And I'd like to see initially, with their experience, their positions to be safeguarded. So I'd like some sort of reassurance that from day one, whenever it was handed over, you wouldn't all jump in and maybe there'd be a transition period where the current committee or some of the current committee, like the old guard with the experience, would then work with people who are interested, like the Trust Board, for example, and you, would you have elections six months or a year down the line of a season? So it's not just thrown in the deep end. Because one of my concerns, obviously, is that if it goes tits up, we're fucked. <coughs> and I don't want that to happen. So we've all got to work together in these things. And obviously one of the things, as someone who's quite new to the football committee, um, and again, a lot of you know, I've been quite critical of the trust in the past, if I'm being polite. Um, but with, with the new people involved in the trust, it's been superb. It's been a breath of fresh air to the club. And I've, I've really enjoyed working with the new, you lot, new people on the trust, with community initiatives in my football committee hat, you know, and we're going to work on a lot more, it's brilliant. One of my concerns though as well, which is, um, is the word trust, because trust has got to work both ways, and you've got to show you're strong enough to take over and show faith in each other. And there's two little things in that, and it's one of them is me very personally speaking, I find it very strange that for whatever reason, the chairman of the trust was elected and he stood down. Um, you didn't have anyone to step into the chairman's position of the trust and to do it for the whole rest of the year. And you took three people, three people members of the trust and volunteered to take it in stages. Now to me, that doesn't sound strength because the work's going to get a lot harder. And to me, as an outsider looking into the how you work, that to me that looks very weak. And before you answer that, the last point I'll make, um, as I say, trust works both ways. And people are entitled to have their own opinions. I don't speak to the book committee man, I speak to myself, and I'm obviously an honest and forthright, I call myself. Now, I was a bit shocked when one of the people who would be heavily involved in the negotiations, presuming his things move on, he may be a future chairman of the trust, I don't know. He's, he's certainly one of your temporary ones. And I read this magazine here, Camberwell Quarterly, or I shouldn't have seen it, which is a magazine of the Camberwell Society. And in their current issue, there's an article by Jonathan Hunt, Greendale All to Play For. And I'm really concerned of some of the words. I know he's working as, a, as an individual. I think, I think, Mishy, this is probably a discussion for another time. No, I don't think so, because he, is, he mentions he's there as a member of Dulwich Abbott Sports Trust Board. And the point I'm emphasising is that people will see that as if he's representing your views. And you'll, you've got to work with Hadley who I hope, I'm hoping will give you ownership of the club. And when he comes out with something like this, and I'll be very brief on this. I think, I think I'll, I'll be very brief on this. There remains the possibility that Southern Property might sell the Ashford Surf area of Greendale to Hadley, plus a bit more for the current pitches are not big enough to accommodate the league's designated stadium to the minimum. Evidence so far suggests Hadley is taking a huge six billion pound gamble and it's the important bit. But before you begin to feel sorry for the firm, if it gets approval for the near top end and so on, the high risk, high reward principles obviously applies. And to me, I find it shocking that someone who is supposed to represent the supporters will come out with, if he's got those private views, I want us to work with Hadley. If I was Hadley, I can't speak for Hadley, they might not be worried about that. But I'd be bloody concerned about that. And as, a, as an individual member of the Sports Trust, I am not happy if a potential chairman comes out with stuff like that, when the future of the club, which we hope will be sustained over there, and which we want to be support a run, if I was happy and they think that about me, I'd be very concerned about handing it over. I, yeah, I, I, get, I, I understand your point, Mishy, 
the trust statement was made on the website on the website in December, and that gives a, a detailed account of uh, where we are on the various issues now and what we're going to be working on on going forward. Um, so I wouldn't go to the trust website, read the, the position statement for um, a, a summary of where well, the trust are well, like and what. And, and you know uh, that is something that's not uh, put out in the trust name necessarily okay um i think there's certainly something there in the first part though isn't there about the expertise which is already at the club and how they're sort of Absolutely. involved yeah, going forward i mean certainly yeah. as there's I, a people who are involved with the trust said. at the moment there are can i just say something there. i don't need the microphone but as as a as a committee member of the football club and, and a board member of the supporters trust as well i'd like to say that the reason we've got rotating chairman is not a weakness it's a it, it's a strength it's ultimately we're looking at a democratic model which which obviously in the end we may well look at one single person but we're looking at different people with different strengths we've got massive strengths on the supporters trust huge diverse experiences and we're trying to bring that into taking Dulwich Hamlet forwards and we're trying to bring it to take Dulwich Hamlet to hopefully a new ground but who knows but if that happens fantastic and then we're going to need everyone including some of the committee members as well because everyone together can take this club forward and, and ultimately I don't really agree with you Mishy that, that having three chairmen every three months is a weakness at this stage because we're actually an evolving trust and it takes time to evolve and I just wanted to add that into the mix. Thank you. Joe, did you want to... Well, I need to give you a bit of comfort. Um, obviously, we're, we're the biggest club amongst the five here. Um, um, you know, we have a, an enormous fan base, sizable trust membership. But the one thing we, we struggle with, uh, I don't know about the other clubs here, is finding people who want to be on the, the board of the trust. When we come round to the annual elections, and, and the rules on elections of the trust board are annual. There's certain restrictions on the length of service. Um, and there's a rotation system of which people have to put themselves up for re-election. What we found at Portsmouth is, apart from the very first year, when we had something like 14 candidates for 10 positions, we've never achieved as much interest that first year. We've struggled to find, in fact the last two elections have been basically um, just done deals before we've even got to the AGM. You know, the, in fact on one, one occasion we didn't even bother counting the votes because there were just about sufficient candidates and people standing for re-election to fill the positions we had. So the, con the continuity thing isn't going to be your problem because the sort of people that want to get involved will stay involved the problem you're going to have is finding new people, fresh blood, to come with fresh ideas. Thank you, Joe. I think I've got to go. I, yes, I think that's pretty much all we've got time for. Um, we're going to, obviously, this is the start of the discussion. We want to carry on the discussion. So please um, uh, contact the Trust. Um, there's forums out there with people discuss things on. Um, join the trust if you haven't joined the trust. There's some forms here um, on the table. Um, uh, James, did, did you want to just su sum things up and yeah. uh, okay. round up well, um, just where we are? Just really, I, I think it <coughs> is genuinely positive what, is, what we've got going on here. I mean, I. Uh, I've been to one board meeting and I was extremely impressed with the colour of people around that board meeting. They're not going to be, and I don't think they're saying they're going to be the people that are going to run and take over this club. Um, but there's, you need just a nucleus of people and there are people who don't want to be on the board and that's completely understandable. What we need to do is make sure that there is a position for everyone who wants to give up their time somewhere. And, um, you know, I don't, I don't mean to sound derogatory, but first time I met Joe, we had the Pompey Sports Trust meeting and it was in this bar and people were 
like we didn't even have chairs in the bar, we were sat on like these old kegs of beer. This Portsmouth. I mean, it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, it was there was there was no there was no mint and lime in my water. <laughs> And each of these guys has got, you know, uh, might not have been sat on beer kegs or whatever, but they're similar journeys. And, and I honestly, genuinely look out here and think about um, some of the groups that I've met. I'm fortunate in, in the job I do in the last couple of years. And, and, I'm, and I'm just thinking, Jesus. How, is, how are we going to get this together? Because I, I just can't see it happening. And, and I genuinely do not feel that here. I feel like there's, there's, all, there's a lot of will, there's a lot of brains, there's um, a great opportunity. Uh, so it's, it's really about answering these difficult questions, trying to come to solutions together, keep moving forward positively, um, and ultimately, hopefully, get in a structure where you know everyone is is happy, and and it's a structure where you don't you don't you can, we can all have a grumble, we can all complain a little bit, but but ultimately, it, you, you know, you realise that you're in this together, and and that will be how it will succeed. That sounds a bit cheesy, but it's it's true. So um, you know, these guys I'm sure will support you. There's another 35 or so others that will do the same, and we 100% will will support you if that's the option you want to go down. So good luck, and hopefully I'll see you. Plenty more time. Uh, two very brief uh, things to say. One is this is an incredible turnout for a club that's not in crisis, um, which I think works well for the future. Um, and, and I think everyone here is passionate about Dulwich, um, Dulwich Hamlet, and creating the best possible future for Hamlet on and off the pitch. And I think together you have the best chance of achieving that. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say is it's January, it's cold, it's a long way to Margate. We are at home to Linfield on Saturday. Six, six points at goals guaranteed. <laughs> Sorry, just one last thing for me as well. Uh, you're due to play us at the Queen Elizabeth Stadium in a couple of Tuesdays time. You're all very welcome. Uh, please do take the opportunity to speak to our supporters and get their view as to what it's like having a supporters run club. So I would encourage you to do that. Okay, well, um, thank you. It's been a really, really useful, positive evening. Um, and uh, we've got a lot, a lot more things to discuss. Um, but I'm sure, you know, you've set us on the right road. So thank you very much for giving up your time um, tonight. Much appreciated.